Hello, everyone, and welcome to our uh, the Siberia Science webinar on deploying uh, LTE, private LTE networks. Uh, we're glad you joined us today. Let's get straight into it. We have a lot to cover. Uh, next slide, and first, uh, we'll just say that we are recording this uh, webinar, and you'll be able to access it afterwards. And regarding questions, uh, we do have the question um, option in the on the top right, and uh, please ask questions. But we will try to get to as much as possible um, at the end of the session. We'll leave some time for that. Um, next slide. So really quick intros of our speakers today. Um, my name is Oren Binder. I'm the marketing director for the CBRS Alliance. And um, I've actually been involved with the Alliance from, from day one. I've been kind of um, lucky to be there at the right time at the right place. Um, and involved with CBRS uh, all the way back since uh, 2016. We also have uh, Yusuf Abdelayla, who is um, from American Tower, from the office of uh, CTO there. Um, a very experienced, uh, again, from been involved with the Alliance from uh, the early days. He's also a board member of the Alliance and uh, has um, hands-on experience with uh, deploying uh, CBRS networks. Next. We also have uh, Ed Pichon, who is a uh, program manager for us, uh, ecosystem, and he's really the, the driving force behind the deployment guide, which uh, basically drove the content for everything you're going to see here today. Um, next slide. So quick agenda. Um, we'll start with my intro, get into, uh, Yusuf will get into um, CBRS, um, and, and what is CBRS and uh, uh, what is a private LTE network. And then we'll go on to Ed, who will get into the nitty gritty of kind of how to deploy a private LTE network. And then we'll circle back and get into Q&A. Uh, next. So this is a really, really brief history of uh, CBRS. A lot has happened um, in the last six years, but this is really just touching the high, high 100,000 uh, feet kind of uh, top points. Back in 2014, the FCC proposed um, the three-tier sharing uh, framework. And in 2016, in August, uh, we were six companies basically that uh, decided to form the CBRS Alliance and start putting together solutions um, for this band, for shared spectrum. Um, three years later, uh, the FCC approved initial commercial deployments and we started uh, working again with uh, actual deployments in a limited area. A few months later, and this is kind of the, the big milestone, January of this year, uh, the band was open uh, for full commercial service. And um, it was all in GAA, and we'll get to the layers uh, afterwards. Um, and then, as you've probably heard, there was a PAL auction, uh, priority access. Um, that concluded last month. We already know who won and what areas. And we totally expect those to get into service um, in the upcoming months um, where we'll see these PALs um, being deployed. Next slide. So I mentioned the CBRS Alliance um, being six members in 2016. We have grown significantly. Right now we're over, we've gone, we've gotten actually to 180. Um, we have a very diverse membership and um, and I think going through the list here it's it's kind of a, a real proof point of how different players and and, and uh, entities in the ecosystem um, identify the opportunity here with shared spectrum on CBRS and are willing to work together to make this happen uh, next slide so just to summarize uh, the first year, we said since, uh, again, since FC's full commercial deployment we're talking about since January this year, we have tens of thousands of uh, um, CBRS radios deployed in the field, both uh, high power, low power, CAT A, CAT B, indoor, outdoor, and in different uh, use cases, uh, mobile broadband, fixed wireless, private LTE, and for uh, several different verticals as well. And going a little bit to the ecosystem, um, talking about the CBSDs, we have 89 authorized. These are ONGO certified uh, radios that are out there. 
Um, and 100, it says 108, honestly, in the last month, it basically bumped up to 128, which is a great sign of authorized client devices. And um, first of all, you can talk a little bit about phones, mobile phones. If you think about all the new iPhones, uh, Samsung Galaxies, um, Google Pixel, LGs, and others, all the new phones that are coming out have Band 48 um, LTE on them, which means that they do support uh, CBRS, which is great. But it's really not only about phones. We also have a lot of new modules coming out, gateways, um, push-to-talk devices, hotspots. Um, tablets and laptops with CBRS inside. And again, that's just a great sign for us of how the ecosystem here is growing. We also have our five authorized SaaS administrators, which we'll get into later on how they fit in here exactly. And uh, over 2,000 CPIs, certified professional installers who can um, install uh, CBRS networks. And then again, we'll get into where exactly you would need those and, and where not uh, afterwards. But again, we're happy with all these numbers. We've also released our um, Ango 5G and our spec. Everything you'll hear about today here will basically uh, be around uh, private LTE um, on the CBRS band. But uh, in the near future, we'll also be talking about uh, deploying 5G in the same band. Next slide. So a little bit on the terminology, you've been hearing me talk about Ango. So if we think about CBRS, CBRS is really, um, it just describes the band, the 3.5 gigahertz band that was released here in the US. Ango is really about the shared spectrum technology um, that culminated from, from all the work that's being done from uh, the Alliance membership. So if really you think about it, customers out there um, that you hear about today are deploying a private LTE network with Ango in the 3.5 band. Uh, next slide. So here it's it's just important. This is my last slide, and I'll hand it over afterwards. But it's really important to understand that uh, um, a significant amount of this high value spectrum is being made available, and it wasn't available obviously beforehand. Uh, and it, and it's really an opportunity to make to to deploy your own high performing, secure private network, private LTE network. Um, with different, totally different complexity and cost points than, than were possible a year ago. And this just makes this basically uh, accessible to everyone. And that's really what's changing, what's possible here. So we're excited to see what's next, but um, let's hand it over now to Yusuf, if we can get a little bit into the details. Thank you, Oren. Uh, my name is Yusuf Abdelaida, and I'll go over, uh, you know, some definition and how do you uh, start with uh, deploying the uh, uh, CBRS, uh, an ongo private LTE, as well as describe some uh, use cases and give a high overview of the process. Um, can you go to the next slide? So what is CBRS? As Oren explained, is basically a spectrum. It's CBRS is C, stands for CB, Citizen Broadband Radio uh, Service, and is a, a three-tier paradigm. So this 150 megahertz spectrum that FCC has opened up to use is opening up all the possibilities to deploy the technology that we've been really uh, enjoying. You know, the cellular connectivity. How does that work? So Originally, uh, this 150 megahertz spectrum, which is uh, 35 gigahertz or band, is known as band 48 in your devices, was used by the military in the Navy and some satellite. So uh, that, that's tier one, which we call incumbent. And then there's tier two, which is called PALP, that stands for Priority Access License. And that's basically a licensed spectrum, about 70 megahertz of the 150. And that's basically been auctioned, and just recently that auction has closed, and some people have bid on that spectrum. And you basically can get up to uh, uh, seven licenses of 10 megahertz block. Maximum you can bid on was 40 megahertz. So they were, uh, the FCC has announced who won that uh, uh, PAL license segment. Then there's tier three, which is the general authorized access, and there's 80 megahertz available from 355 to 3700. And basically that's uh, a 
what we call lightly licensed. So you, you don't have to, to bid on it and that's available for general use. And one of the secret sauce for managing this multi-tier and how do you protect each tier from uh, interfering to the other tier is this uh, uh, paradigm or what we call secret sauce is the, the SAS which is basically this spectrum access uh, system. And the, the role of that uh, software uh, is to manage the spectrum and you know, authorize the utilization of the spectrum efficiently. And one of the key elements is that if it, nobody in this multi-tier is not using that spectrum, you can all go to GIA. So GIA can go from 80 megahertz all the way to 150 megahertz is we know that all the wireless connectivity start with the spectrum and we know how uh, spectrum is, is scarce. This really is an efficient, efficient way to, to uh, uh, use the spectrum among all different users. Next slide, please. So uh, we talked about CBRS as being the, the spectrum and that's very necessary to deploy any wireless uh, connectivity. We, ha we have now share spectrum, which is really new. And, uh, and then we have the unlicensed spectrum, which Wi-Fi has been enjoying. And we have the licensed spectrum, which is basically the public network that exists today. So what is OnGo Network? So uh, OnGo is the new brand that CBRS Alliance has established to deploy uh, technology for your connectivity be it LTE, 4G, or in the future, 5G. And the idea behind OnGo uh, is to create basically a, uh, an ecosystem that can be certified and give you the flexibility to mix and match various dev devices and deploy a network at really lower cost, just like you would do in Wi-Fi. And these are some of the elements that are needed to deploy an OnGo network. So I, I talked about before SAS, that's the Spectrum Access System, which basically that's a software a cloud service that is provided by five entities, which are members of CBRS Alliance and are approved by the FCC. They have access of the database where all the incumbents uh, will be and they manage and try to protect each tier from interference. So they give access to what we call CBSDs. CBSDs are the, the radios, which CBSD stand for Citizens Broadband Radio Service. And these are basically the base station, as some of you may know, or we call them enode Bs or small cell or uh, macro cell. Basically, they are supporting band 48, which is CBRS. And there are two types of CBSDs or small cells or uh, base station. There's category A, which is a low power and mainly is for indoor. And there's a category B, which is high power and is for outdoor. And another key element uh, that is uh, necessary for deploying an ongoing network is what we call an EPC. It's, it stands for Evolved P Packet Core. So think of your wireless local area network. You have some APs, you need a core, and this is basically the role of the core is to manage your um, traffic, be it uh, data, voice, and multimedia, and also make sure that uh, the quality of service uh, depends on the priority of the traffic, and also it, it, it handles the mobility. So when you are roaming and uh, the, all that is being managed as well as there are some elements that manage the subscriber database and also the authentication and of course the secu security, and then it runs all that traffic to the internet based on the priority that is uh, designed to meet the application needs. And uh, finally, you need end devices. And uh, as Oren mentioned, one of the, the, the things that uh, the Alliance had focused on to make sure it enable the adoption of the ONGO LTE using CBRS band is to have a rich ecosystem. And if you look on, on the right side, uh, you could see that uh, th there are devices that first have to be approved by the uh, FCC, so the FCC authorized, uh, uh, you know, use. So, and then they go into the certification process. And you could see if you go to the uh, Alliance website, you'll find that uh, the uh, ecosystem day by day is keep uh, growing. So we have about uh, over 47 plus. Uh, that include, uh, uh, as I said, base station for indoor outdoor. And devices, as uh, Oren mentioned earlier, all the major phones have the band 48, and uh, as well as uh, dongles that you can, uh, you know, uh, install on your laptop, and and you get them to connect. And we have some gateways for IoT, and we have a uh, CPEs, which is a customer promise equipment, where basically you can bring in 
your uh, you know, LTE network all the way to the home. Uh, next slide, please. So what is private LTE? And that's what I'm going to talk in this session. Now that we know, uh, we learn about CVRs being the spectrum and that ONGO is the brand to the uh, network technology LTE 4G or 5G, whatever that may be, is it evolve? Next slide, please. So ONGO private LTE is uh, basically, if I step back here for a second, all we know that everybody has Wi-Fi in their homes or uh, at work. And then we know and we enjoy the public network, which is you basically subscribe to, to the uh, major carriers. So uh, all, for the first time in history, because of the available CBRS band, now you can bring that public network that you use and custom and love into deploying uh, at work and the enterprise and you know take advantage of all this benefit that an LTE technology provide to you. So this is basically private because it's not open to general access because the, the, whoever deployed the network, they basically decide who would use it and for what use case you will use. So think of the public network now you deploy it private because CBRS is enabled to do that. And, and, and as I said before, this is even though you have the general uh, GAA band to use for, let's say, for an in-building use case, the SAS is enabling you to make sure that there's no interference, not like Wi-Fi and license, where basically everybody, you know, is a best effort. In here is really control and is a clean channel that enable you to deploy a multi-service network. And that's one of the advantages of LTE that today you'll be able to deploy to solve some of your key problem at really lower economics, just like Wi-Fi. And so now you complete that. So if you, you think of a circle being public and Wi-Fi, the private LTE come between those two and enable you to deploy uh, that network for your own use. So it can be deployed by uh, any enterprise uh, beside the, the uh, usual suspects. Uh, like the MNO and the MSO, but anybody can uh, go and uh, basically uh, gather this equipment and I'll go a little bit later over what typical uh, process looks like to deploy the network. And then one of the advantage of LTE is inherently being secure. So even though you have that band 48 on your phone and you go to, let's say, a mall that have an on-go private network, it's not automatically you will see it. You have to provision what we call a SIM, that's a sub subscriber identity module that is in your phone. So typically when you buy a phone, you need to have a SIM that is provided by your carrier. In this case, if you, th this could be a service that the enterprise can, uh, can give to the employee or provide to their customer. So now when they get into that network, they can enjoy basically a clean uh, uh, LTE network for their own uh, use. And there are a lot of use cases, which I'm gonna cover a little bit. I, I hinted earlier about security and surveillance. There are, for example, if you go to casinos or some uh, you know, high security uh, environments, you won't see an IP camera running on Wi-Fi. It's always connected via fiber or an ethernet cable. So this gives the ability to take that camera with some devices part of the ecosystem and convert an IP to an LTE camera. And now you can expand that security uh, you know, uh, system that you have. But also uh, these other use cases like employee safety. So you can use like push to talk on that band because every network has a capacity limitation. And, and, and so you can create a private channel that you communicate basically with the employee or facility manager. And as we move into industry 4.0 and automation in manufacturing uh, or some very sophisticated uh, application like robot and uh, autonomous vehicle or AGV for the manufacturer, they rely a lot on mobility. And this is inherent in an LTE technology. And that's some of the use cases that can be enabled with private LTE. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a picture that illustrates basically what I just said earlier. So if you look at this diagram, we're talking about CBRS, which is basically cell, either outdoor or indoor. So, so this is, may look similar to some of you guys deploying a, uh, a, a Wi-Fi network. So you, you need a, 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 you know, a, an AP or a, a base station, that's what we call CBSD. And you need basically some cabling. I'm not gonna go over that. It's like standard cabling that you do LTE. So you may have basically ethernet or fiber. And you need some uh, uh, switches or router, access switches and some core switches. And then what is new here is the Evolve Packet Core. 
And that's I've talked about before, and that's basically what managed the network and optimized the network for different traffic and router to the internet is what is managing basically the uh, uh, mobility. And what is new with CBRS is basically, as I mentioned before, SAS, which manages basically the spectrum efficiently so that makes sure everybody take advantage of that spectrum and it's clean. And more importantly, that when nobody in that tier, like let's say Paul or the incumbent not using it, the people in GAA uh, uh, tier, they can uh, uh, inherit the rest of the spectrum and now they have 150 megahertz of that spectrum. And then you have the UE devices. As I talk about, there's the CPEs where you can basically turn any of your cameras or current devices in point of cell to, to use, average and use over the LTE, as well as your smartphone are already here and you have tablets. We have some gateways that are already can communicate as a backhaul via CBR, uh, CBRS uh, Ongo LTE. And now you can basically for, let's say you have an area that is remote and you have no way, no way to reach connectivity uh, and there's no backhaul. This is an easy and quick way at really uh, low TCO where you can uh, stand up that same network that you have. And now in a remote area, you can do IoT gateway for various smart application, be it smart parking or some smart security or energy and what have you. So there are many options that we offer to the ecosystem uh, device that exists today. But uh, the, the nice thing is I said earlier, the LTE is inherently secure. It solves a lot of mobility and is an, a, th a technology that is uh, uh, offer you multi-services. And what I mean by that, even if you use like an end device, you want to basically give priority to voice, which is voice over LTE. You can create QoS. You can add, uh, for example, new application like AR, VR, and prioritize that network to make sure that the uh, customer experience is enhanced. And this is one of the advantages that LTE has over other wireless local area network. Um, next uh, slide, please. So, so before OnGo was here, what did OnGo solve? So as I mentioned before, the only two wireless technology you had is Wi-Fi, I mean, for your own personal use, and also the uh, public. Now, th this is the first time you'll be able to do private LTE, and some of the challenges that exist is that there was no spectrum available. You either had li and license and license, so, uh, and also there was no hardware for you to deploy that. So most of the hardware that existed was uh, uh, small cell or base station were for license, and so basically, if you have to deploy something, you don't have the license to deploy that. So you'll likely have to purchase the, the network to uh, the, the public, which predominantly today, if you go to the large public venue, what's being deployed today is DAS, distributed service. And that's a license that basically the uh, MNO uh, will deploy for the, those facilities because the, it, there's a need that meets the ROI. And then, of course, the and devices, and today you get to enjoy with Ongo to the ecosystem partner, different devices, as I talked about earlier. And then the uh, network infrastructure network operation. One of the goal of the Ongo LTE private network is the ease of deployment and also of management. So when when you're ready to deploy this network, you'll find it that is uh, similar to, uh, in terms of ease of deployment and management uh, like Wi-Fi. And that was basically the goal. Uh, of how to leverage that CBS band to deploy a network that is uh, easy to deploy and, and, and at lower economic. And one of the uh, final points I want to mention here, if you go and visit, for example, the stadium and is people bring BYUD devices and, and, and DAS is a neutral host uh, service where people get to enjoy their cellular connectivity, is a stadium, for example, one of the uh, way that they recover that investment, they want to be able to engage with their fan and enhance that experience. So they typically will do it over Wi-Fi. This is for the first time in history if they deploy that private LTE network. They'll be to, to gather data on uh, insights on their customer how they use a network, and now they'll be able to provide really bespoke or customized marketing to enhance that experience. But not only that, uh, that, 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 that data could be extremely useful even for the uh, some of the application. Uh, for example, uh, if you have a player, they can generate different biometric uh, or um, data such uh, that, that they can transmit over the private LTE and you can leverage that data to provide uh, different applications. And so all these challenges have been really uh, uh, solved and, and, uh, by the private LTE. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, some of the questions are, why do I need to deploy private LTE? Well, if I talked and hinted before, 
So different enterprise and industry vertical have a gap in their wireless solution. I said you either have public or Wi-Fi, and there are some applications that are necessary uh, that private LTE uh, fill in that gap. So for in-building, I mentioned, for example, more uh, today, if you look at education, everybody's standing from home, you need that reliable communication that is secure for the data keeping, for example. Today, when Wi-Fi is loaded, I mean, even in my house today, everybody's standing from home, you can see the gradation in the performance. This is, in terms of having a robust, high performance network, LTE is definitely a superior technology and, and, and you're able to do that with private networks. So it's consistent. And similarly, if you get into application, like as I mentioned, uh, in industry, uh, where you do in robot, one of the key uh, criteria is consistent low latency. And this is what LTE is known for. And with Ongo Private LTE is that uh, uh, able to do. And, 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 and then I will mention about mobility which is inherent and because we are constantly are on on the go and moving around we make sure that we carry our communication seamlessly and as i talked about earlier if you go into hospital or healthcare or military or any one of these and you're doing some financial transactions security is really critical uh, for example uh, i talked about points of sale earlier points of sale there are some standard compliance by the credit card which is called, for example, PCI standards, and then you would never do it over Wi-Fi. And LTE fill in that gap we would on go private LTE by providing enhanced security to the SIM authentication. So, uh, and, and so these are a lot of different use cases that uh, uh, the private on go LTE has solved. So when each uh, vertical, be it in building or public spaces or industrial, uh, you know, you could see different uh, use cases that you can develop in this business case to find uh, justification why you need a private LTE. Another another use case I, I like to, to mention, which I hinted before, is about how do you uh, provide customer experience? Because customer experience uh, impact you uh, the churn and hence has has an impact on your uh, uh, revenue. So having AR, VR uh, to, for example, when you go to a stadium and try to do uh, tran transfer that uh, fan to, to uh, have that uh, immersive experience, you need that low latency and LTE, uh, on-go privacy will enable that. Uh, next um, slide, please. So uh, finally, with the, uh, the the business case, as I mentioned, and I hinted this before, one of the ad advantages of using private uh, LTE is that a lot of the cus uh, the, the the customer being enterprise or uh, large public venue, uh, you want to basically solve their problem, and I showed basically the, the the some of the use cases that solve some of those gaps that exist today. And the other one is how do they help them generate revenue? This is basically the, the economics of the private LTE are are, are uh, uh, really uh, optimize your CapEx and OPEX, and also by enhancing the uh, customer experience to lower the churn, hence, uh, you know, uh, saving basically uh, the cost of deployments and and and, and uh, lowering both the CapEx and, and, and OPEX. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so how do you, uh, so we is that like first thing you want to start with the business case and what is the use case for a particular um, vertical so we talk about smart building uh what are what are some of the use cases that you would deploy to justify the the, the deployment of private lt if you take a lot of these uh, building for example they have uh uh, lead glass with the public network will not penetrate and uh, they cannot even do a uh, a, phone, a voice call so this could be a, a use case this is an ri for the property owner because they will lose tenants because they cannot provide a, a cellular connectivity. And so you start looking at uh, what, you know, since you have the use case, now you develop the, the uh, business case and, you know, you justify the ROI or the investment. Then you start looking at and doing assessment and figure out if you're developing basically a cellular connectivity or smart building application, what type of IoT and how many sensor you would need. And then you start the, also looking at the, the type of data you need to collect and what kind of services. And these are all some of the elements that uh, later on you get to hear more in detail that you need to uh, gather in order for you to uh, develop that ROI and, and provide the private LTE that meets the needs of the customer. Next slide. 
And again, similarly, this is another example. When you go to the stadium, and I it talks about this earlier, uh, the, you probably have DAS, you have Wi-Fi, but uh, there is a capacity uh, issue when you have 100 uh, fans attending a, a game. Uh, basically, even the public network will bring what we call a cow cellular on wheels. If you have a private network, uh, you get to expand the capacity. And more importantly, uh, there's also elements of you can do uh, uh, roaming or neutral host where you can basically uh, monetize that same network, or you can use it for the fan experience, like I mentioned earlier, to AR, VR, or you can provide uh, service for your own use, like points of sale or remote access to area for people to use Uber and what have you, where you don't have zero connectivity. Next slide. Thank you. So to summarize, so typically, how do you deploy? What is that process or workflow looks like? And a lot of you probably familiar, like any wireless network, you you, you start with gathering requirements, you, you do a survey and planning, and you do an RF design and a network design, then you implement and install, and of course, there's operation a part of it. And then, so uh, like I talked about before, you want to basically uh, map your use case to solve a problem to that application for whatever vertical that may be, be it uh, airport or education or industry. And so we have the, the, the different uh, equipment. So you, uh, it talks about having uh, CPE for fixed wireless access. And then you have uh, UEs and other devices that you can use for mobility. And then you do the RF design, be it outdoor, indoor. So you have to look into capacity, how many users. You have to also look at is this a coverage capacity or boats and then there's the radio uh, access network which uh, if it's an outdoor indoor combination then you use you select the right uh, uh, you know uh, baseband uh, you know product is outdoor category a uh, category a for indoor or category b for outdoor and then that talks about uh, evolved packet core and that's basically uh, there's different way, different ways to deploy this uh, where you can split the the user plane from the data plane depends on the use case that you deploy if is uh, you want to keep the data local to the application because to some low latency but also there's some economics that can help you when you deploy the EPC do you keep it on the cloud or you put it in the server at the location or you make it uh, distributed and then of course the, after the EPC can enable you to uh, interface to all the packet data network to uh, provide all different applications uh, be it Voltio data analytic and finally there's what we call the, the uh, OSS BSS for both operation and business services that you would provide uh, and those are elements that are necessary to uh, operate the network and also provide all the business uh, services in the back end and with that uh, thank you, and I'll pass it along to add to go into more details. All right, uh, thank you, Youssef. Uh, so at this point, uh, we're going to start walking through the process of deploying a private LTE network in a little bit more detail. As Oren mentioned, we have a deployment guide uh, that walks through this in a lot of detail, uh, and this will be following roughly that deployment guide, and we'll be publishing that here in the next day or two, and we'll be sending that to you. Uh, for you to use. So we go to the next slide. So this first step, uh, as Yusef mentioned, is to gather the requirements for your system. And this is the case where you're really just trying to uh, determine what is the problem that you are trying to solve? What is it that you need this network to do? And at this stage, it's really answering a, a, a series of questions about what you're trying to accomplish. And if you'll go to the next slide, we list these questions in our, our deployment guide and we walk through it uh, with a couple of scenarios the, the sports venue and the smart building scenario we walk through this process in the deployment guide and provide a little checklist version of this stage to help you through the process but again the purposes uh, of this step is to figure out what your network is trying to do what is the problem you're trying to solve and a bunch of other related questions to help you figure out the constraints and what it is you're trying to do. So like uh, considering uh, who will be connecting to your network work. Is it gonna be a fixed list of users or is it gonna be constantly changing? Uh, what kind of devices will be connecting? Are they gonna be fixed in place? Or are they gonna be mobile? What kind of data are they transmitting or receiving? And what level of security do you need? And on that last, you know, the good news uh, with an on-go network is you get enterprise grade LTE security right out of the box. Once you've gone through and uh, looked at these questions and figure out what you want the network to do, uh, you can move on to the next uh, stage. If we go to the next slide. 
and that is the survey and planning stage. And this is where you start scoping out uh, what it's going to take for your network to solve these problems. Uh, there's a couple of different state, uh, elements for this. The first is a site, uh, a site survey. You also wanna start estimating your traffic needs uh, and determine if you, for example, need a PAL license and identify potential vendors. Uh, the most important task, if we go to the next slide, or the first uh, stage of this is uh, to do your site survey. Now, the purpose of this is not to get a detailed blueprint of all the area that you're covering. Uh, the purpose here is to get an overall sense of the space. What are the dimensions of the area to be covered? What's indoors? What's outdoors? Where are there major obstructions that could interfere with signal propagation? You also want to note where you have power and data infrastructure already plumbed in on your location, because that's going to be where it's going to be easiest for you to install your, your uh, base stations, your access points. Now you also wanna note where are your users going to be? Where are the places where you have lots of users? Where are the places where you don't have a lot of users? What kind of data are the users in this given area going to be generating? And then lastly, you wanna identify where are the really critical devices that you are trying to identify and provide uh, coverage to. So if there is something in really important to your use case, you wanna make sure you understand where those critical devices are. If we go to the next slide. The next element of this is to start estimating your traffic needs. Uh, this is an important step because a lot of your design decisions on your network are based off the anticipated traffic. Uh, the good news is, is that it's really easy to calculate uh, you figure out what kind of data traffic, what the source of data traffic is going to be per user, and you multiply it by the number of users that are in a given area. And uh, we list here some typical data rates. For a voice call, uh, the data rate's really quite low. It's on 12 kilobits per second. That's when you start trying to transmit video uh, that your data rates uh, go way up. Uh, from two and a half megabits per second at 480p all the way up to 25 megabits if you're trying to do 4K HD. So if you have uh, your deployment, you have say six cameras that are going to be transmitting uh, 480p video. Uh, you take a look at that, it's two and a half megabits per second. You multiply that six and that's, uh, what is that? That's what, 15 megabits per second is what you need in terms of your capacity of your network. That's your bandwidth need. And if you have special, special devices doing specific tasks, you wanna find out what those, uh, what those elements and what those systems need in terms of data capacity on the uplink and the downlink. And once you have a sense of your traffic need, then it's uh, time to go to the next slide and look at the, uh, the channel bandwidth that you're gonna to need to serve those devices. Now, uh, calculating the capacity of an LTE system, it's a fairly complex set of calculations. Fortunately, there's a bunch of online tools that can do these calculations for you. Uh, we have a link here to one at cellmapper.net that can do this. Uh, there's a, a couple of different factors that feed into this. One is your TDD configuration. This is your time division duplex configuration. LTE in the CBRS band is in a TDD mode, which means different time slots are allocated for the base station to transmit while other uh, slots are allocated for the, the user equipment, the devices, the mobile phones to transmit. And you can actually tune your network to allocate more, uh, more of the time slots to uplink or downlink depending on your need. So uh, TDD configuration one is a relatively uh, balanced uh, allocation Network uh, configuration two is downlink heavy, configuration six is, is uplink heavy. In addition to the TDD config, you also uh, need to consider the channel bandwidth. Uh, as was mentioned uh, by Orrin and Yousef, the standard in uh, the CBRS band is a 10 megahertz channel, and LTE plays quite happily at 10 megahertz, and you can see um, here listed on this chart at, at TDD config one, the kind of bandwidth you can get at 10 megahertz. But you can also uh, ask for multiple channels and use multiple channels. Uh, LT really likes to sit at 20 uh, megahertz. Uh, you can end up using two channels or if you have access to even more channels, you can do something called carrier aggregation. So you can take even more channel, allocate more bandwidth 
uh, to your system if you need it. There's also the issue of modulation, and I don't want to go into the details on that, but basically uh, the better your signal is, the closer you are to the base station, you can go to a higher data rate modulation, which will increase your, your bandwidth. Uh, there's also the receiver diversity or antenna diversity called MIMO, multiple in, multiple out, uh, that again, if you're uh, close to the base station, you can typically go at a higher MIMO level, and different devices have different levels of MIMO capability, and that can also increase your data rate. Now this gives you uh, the total downlink and uplink budget that is available on the channel. And this is uh, spread across all devices. This isn't on a per device basis. So if you look at that top row, you would have 10.4 megabits per second that would have to be divided amongst all of the different devices that might be in that particular cell. A couple other considerations are that devices that are moving uh, typically have a slightly lower bandwidth capacity than ones that are fixed. Uh, and as you get further away from the cell, the base station, you start uh, your data rate's going to start going down. Now, unlike some other technologies, the nice thing about LTE is, well, that the sig your bandwidth will uh, decrease. As you get further away from the base station, it levels off very quickly and reaches a minimum performance floor that it maintains all the way to the edge of the cell until you get to the point where you just don't have any coverage at all. But you typically have consistent, reliable performance all the way out to the edge of the cell. So once you've done that, if we go to the next slide, I think this we go into some examples. Oh, sorry, we're now talking about the PAL. One of the questions that you're gonna to wanna to ask yourself is do you need a PAL, one of these priority access licenses? Now, this is a, a somewhat complex problem, that, but the general answer is no. You probably don't uh, for, for an indoor private LTE network, especially. Uh, PAL is worth getting if you're you're doing a large coverage area or an outdoor deployment using the higher powered Category B CBSDs base stations. Uh, you also may want to consider if you have some mission critical applications, as the PALs are protected from interference by GAA users. And if you're in a really crowded environment that there's lots of CBRS networks in your area, it might be worth getting a PAL. But as mentioned, the PAL auction has closed just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the FCC auctioned these off on a per county basis. Uh, but you can sub-license from the existing PAL holders. They're not required to do so, uh, but they may be interested. You can go look at the auction results and see who owns the PALs in the county that you're deploying your network and see if they'd be willing to let you sub-license and uh, add your network essentially to their, their PAL. Next slide. The other question that comes up a lot is, you know, will I get denied access by the SAS? The SAS can say, I'm sorry, you, you, you don't, you can't use the, the, your channels right now because uh, somebody else with higher priority access uh, needs that needs access. Um, the general answer is that this is very unlikely to happen, but it does depend on your location and the type of license you have. As mentioned, there are incumbents that have highest priority and the band is uh, cleared to, pr or the channels that they're using are cleared out by the SAS when they're active. Um, there's generally two types. There's fixed sites that are known and already registered in advance. Um, and then there are mobile sources. These are typically radar, uh, naval radar systems. And so these are typically show up along the coasts and near naval facilities. So you can sort of look at the map and see where things are and you'll be able to tell to a first order approximation whether there are a lot of incumbents around. Uh, PALs do have higher priority access over GAA users. Um, however, as, as mentioned, uh, the majority of the band is actually reserved for GAA users. So even in a, a location, a county where all the PALs are currently active, the majority of the band is open for GAA users. Uh, if to get really specific details and, and give a sense of the, the numbers, you can talk to the SASs. Uh, they will be able to provide information for your location about incumbents in the area, other GA users, and that kind of thing. Uh, next line, or next slide. The other thing you need to do is you also need to get some identifiers that we manage from the network. We uh, these are used to help make sure your network doesn't interfere with other networks and operates correctly. Um, and you can get them from the Alliance by emailing at the address here. Uh, there's a small fee and we'll give you the uh, the identifiers you need. You'll also need an MC block number 
This is part of the numbers that are put on the SIM cards or the, the USIMs or eSIMs that are put are in devices. Uh, you get those from the USMC administrator. Um, and there's a link here. They have a form specifically for CBRS networks and they can provide you an MC block number and that's useful. I think it's for 100,000 devices, maybe 10,000, I can't remember which, but you'll need to get that number to support your network. Next line. The question that comes up is then, at, when do you want to use OnGo? When is the right OnGo gonna be the right solution for your problem? Uh, there's lots of different technologies you could use. Uh, the places where OnGo typically has a has a good advantage, where LTE uh, really shines, there's are cases where you have lots of devices on your network that you need to control. Uh, LTE is really good at handling large numbers of devices, and it'll give them consistent access uh, to the network and to network resources on a controlled basis. Even when you have lots of devices, they'll all be able to get on and get at service. Uh, LTE is also really great at mobility. So if you have moving devices, LTE's handovers between access points are great. Um, and then if your access points are difficult to place uh, or you're in a complex radio environment, the higher power levels that we can use on our base stations uh, generally means you just get better coverage per access point than with other systems. Next slide. Um, and cover uh, the remaining material and give us time to answer questions. Uh, as mentioned, we talk uh, through a couple of scenarios in our deployment guide uh, that go through this, but let's skip over this. Let's go to the next slide. Actually, I think we want to skip the slide after that too, as we walk through those process and you can see the details in the deployment guide. Once you've finished the survey and planning stage, it's time to really start doing the detailed design of your system. Uh, there are integrated solution providers that can help you do this. Uh, many of them are members of the CBRS Alliance, but you can also do this yourself. Even if you go with one of these integrated providers, uh, they're gonna be asking the same questions and trying to understand the same problems. So you're gonna end up going through the first two state steps yourself anyway. But at this point is when you really are doing the detailed design where you're selecting the vendors of your devices and systems and deciding how it's gonna be, how you're going to put it together, where your CBSDs are going, how they're gonna be configured and how you're gonna deploy your core network. As Yusef mentioned, the, the, the network infrastructure backend, the EPC, the Evolved Packet Core, you have lots of options for how you do with that. You can have it on site, you can have it cloud-based. Um, and we're not talking about a huge amount of hardware. If you do it on site, I've seen EPCs for private LT networks running on Raspberry Pis. So the, the, it's fairly easy to deploy. You just have to figure out how you're gonna configure it. Uh, if you'll go to the next slide, I give a little bit more detail on this. You, you, what you're trying to figure out, you're, you're deciding what the, the configuration of your channels is gonna be, where you're gonna place uh, your base stations, your CBSDs. Uh, there are specialist providers that can help you do that, uh, but you can also do it yourself. Uh, and these are the kind of things you do at that final design stage. Once you've made these design decisions, uh, we can go, let's go two slides ahead, I believe. Skip over the scenarios here. Then it's time to install your network, plug it in, turn it on, uh, configure everything. There's one little tricky bit is that you need a, what's called a certified uh, professional installer that is uh, required by the regulations for this band. And this is somebody that's gone through an accredited training program and basically registers the information about your, your network with the SAS system. Uh, you can uh, contract with the CPI or you can become a CPI yourself. There are multiple training programs that do it. It's like a day of training uh, to get approved as a CPI. But once you put it all together, you turn it on. Uh, the great thing about uh, CBRS is the SASs work very quickly. And if you're a GAA user, you can get, you'll be granted access to the net spectrum in a matter of seconds. So it happens very quickly once you flip the switch. Go to the next slide. Once you've finished uh, installing and turned it on, it's now time to operate. And this is where uh, you start looking at things like your KPIs, your key performance indicators, of the metrics you wanna use to track the effectiveness and performance of your network and define the alarms and alerts that will alert your, your IT people, what needs to be, that something needs to be addressed, if there's an issue to be fixed. And if you're using an integrated solutions provider, these are the things you negotiate with them as part of the, whatever contract you put in place with them. 
But uh, I, that comes to the end of my section. Again, we have a lot more detail on this in our deployment guide. Uh, and we'll be sending that out in the next couple of days. It'll give you a lot more information and a lot more detail on this. Uh, if we go to the next slide, I just want to repeat uh, Orrin and Youssef's statement. You know, the, the great thing about this, the opening of the CBRS ban and the advances in the LTE systems, it's now meant where it's now made it possible to deploy private LTE, where it really just was not practical to do before. And we're really looking forward to seeing <clears throat> what people do with these technologies and the kind of things you're able to make it do. So with that, I think uh, we've entered the question and answer period. So I guess I'm going to be joined by my other panelists. Yeah, and we did get quite a few questions. So I'll start shooting them at both of you. Um, we'll just I will start with the softball. Um, so the question: Can a sim be physical and an eSIM? Do both work? Even I know the answer. Yeah. There. That's cool. yeah. So that's correct. Uh, you see a lot of the phones, uh, you know, have coming up with dual SIM, the iPhone, the, the Pixel. This was a popular in other country. And so, yes, most of the phone have eSIM and SIM. And that's quite useful for private network. This way, one SIM could be in your public and then uh, use the eSIM to provide, uh, you know, authentication to uh, use the private LTE. So, yeah. So the answer is really basically that it could be either physical or an eSIM. Both would work. Um, next question, also, I'll, I'll, Yusuf, I'll get you for this one as well. And you talked about the stadium example. So there's a question, how would this work in a stadium where everyone coming in would need a special SIM card? Yeah, so, so as I mentioned before, is this phone have an eSIM and dual SIM? This is part of the, uh, you know, the stadium where they can provide, basically, when they buy a ticket, they can provide, for example, a QR voucher where they can use that to get on that network. And because now you're gonna have eSIM, you'll be easily uh, download the profile into that phone to be able to uh, uh, connect to that network. This is one, one possibility uh, in how you would use it as a fan coming to that stadium. Yeah, great. Um, okay, one for me actually. Do we see Ango extending to other shared spectrums around the world? Uh, the only thing I'll, I'll want to say here is that we're getting a ton of interest um, from this different places in, in both Europe and um, Latin America and Asia about this scheme and how it's working because it is a novel kind of the first time it's really been tried in, in this capacity. And um, yeah, we're looking at least to, to give away less lessons learned and, and make sure um, we don't hoard the info here and, and, and uh, basically educate other places that want to learn of how this worked. Um, Ed, one for you. You talked about a near PAL user. So, what distance would that be? Would be he be called a near PAL user? Uh, it that's a tricky question to answer. The PALs actually the the SAS's systems, the spectrum access systems, actually do propagation modeling, and so they look at the power levels of the different CBSDs that are involved in the network, and where they're located, and whether they're indoors and outdoors. Uh, to determine if they get sufficient isolation. I can't tell you off the top of my head like a specific number, uh, but we're talking on the order of hundreds of yards, I think is probably a reasonable statement to say on this, but it's really specific to the power levels of the devices involved. So for example, a category B, one of these higher powered 50 watt devices, if that was part of a PAL, the potential protection area would be larger than if it was a smaller category A device inside a building, for example. Okay, cool. And okay, this one I'll I'll start and use if you you can take on after I, after I give my take. But it's how do you identify enterprises that are considering Angle private LTE networks? So I'll just say that that in our experience, we're we're really working to educate the market about the existence of this and then learn what the enterprises are trying to do. It's not like an enterprise is now looking to deploy Ango. An enterprise is looking to solve use cases and, and case studies and understand, again, what new opportunities that he couldn't do before he could now. Once you educate the enterprise and he knows best about, again, what he's trying to do. So it's really about getting a, a first education and then use cases and case studies of what exists out there in these initial deployments. And then you start hearing back from enterprises of, hey, so wait, can I do this or can I do that? And and it's really starting a dialogue in that way. 
but you, so if you have experience firsthand, obviously, with this. Thank you, Orin. And I agree with Orin uh, said, and CBS Alliance has uh, developed a lot of collateral and uh, discussing this use case that solves some of this gap, and you can find some a lot of information there. But just to give you some example, I mean, we know the enterprise, uh, you know, especially in buildings that are less than 1 million square foot, they suffer tremendously with having cellular connectivity. Uh, for 1 million and above, uh, that problem is solved by DAS. And so there's a gap. So what what is the alternative today? They either use Wi-Fi to do, for example, uh, you know, a uh, voice over Wi-Fi. Uh, we can, you know, it's a bridge, but then they still suffer from the silicon connectivity. This is, you see a gap, there's a problem and there's a need. If you take, like I mentioned earlier, a building where they have multi-offices and tenants, that, that customer is gonna lose revenue. So he has an urgency to provide a cellular connectivity. And this is where private LT can come in and uh, you, you, not only for his own use, he can solve that uh, voice communication, basic uh, cellular connectivity doesn't, that is his problem. Good, I'm just uh, running through, we're getting a lot of questions, but let's, let me throw one more. This one would go to um, Ed, are there specific companies that will help with SIM management? I think you started to cover that. Yeah, you could expand on it a little bit. Yeah, there are a number of companies that support SIM management. Uh, some of them are, are members of the Alliance, uh, but there are multiple different firms that provide management tools, both in terms of hardware and software management systems to keep track of your devices. Uh, don't I can't name any specific ones, uh, but there are a bunch out there. Uh, if you look at our member list and do some quick Googling, you should be able to find plenty of options. Yeah, I'm glad you didn't mention it, but yeah, get us in trouble here. Um, Yusuf, how does this connectivity work with utility poles and streetlights for a city? Oh yeah, so so uh, so that's uh, kind of basically part of smart furniture is uh, uh, part of small cell deployment, right? So a lot of the uh, the the, the search pole or smart pole already have fiber and power. So this is be just like an outdoor deployment. So we deploy, especially for capacity enhancements in uh, urban area, you'll deploy the high power and you try to enhance capacity by providing, for example, a neutral host solution. So if you are a neutral host provider, integrator, even smart city that can provide connectivity for their own use for smart transportation or uh, other smart uh, city application, you can also provide uh, capacity augmentation to that uh, private network and uh, generate revenue to uh, recover some of the investments. So that's basically one of the use cases. Um, okay, we'll get into a couple more. This one, I'm not sure. It, it, the question is, which CBL, CBR small cells support IoT? Example, LTE CAT M1 devices. So I'm not sure that the small cells uh, should support IoT, but then maybe you could expand a little bit on to them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So so basically, CAT M and narrowband IoT, these are uh, standard protocol part of the LTE evolution. Uh, I think because CBRS today is TDD and most of what we see today, uh, IoT is going to be in the next release. I think it came in 15, but today the CBRS Alliance, at least in uh, Network Working Group, uh, is not supported today. But eventually as part of having that network, it will evolve to support narrowband IoT as part of that LTE evolution standard. So you'll support both CAD-M and narrowband IoT without needing a gateway. But, but but just to expand on that, I mean, which I highlighted earlier, today there are other gateway that provide other protocol like LoRaWAN and Zigbee or Z-Wave uh, that basically using that uh, band 48 to backhaul because a lot of these gateways for IoT, they need redundant connectivity. And uh, one way to provide redundant connectivity beside having, you know, like a wired or Wi-Fi or maybe use GSM uh, or LTE to public network, you can start using CBRS uh, private LTE. Um, to have a redundant connectivity. Okay, and maybe the last one we're getting, we have a few more, but we'll, we'll a few things I wanted to say here because we're getting questions about the slides. The recording, the slides, the deployment guide will all be made available and sent out to you to everybody who registered for this webinar. So you'll have all of that. Um, and the last question, I mean, and again, we got a few here, is when, if at all, do you expect CBRS equipment to be available for small office business deployment at reasonable price points? I can start with that and say that I'm already seeing a lot of initiatives from vendors dropping price points and and um, and again maybe a little bit of coverage, but but for small offices, I expect we're looking at months now that you will start to see um, solutions out there that are targeted towards the smaller. Um, they, this this is not a solution for 
uh, only for for Manhattan skyscrapers or, or or stadiums. This this like I said, within months, if not even today, you have um, solutions targeted. And I will I'll even go out on a limb and say that the prices are getting closer and closer to Wi-Fi prices. I don't know, Yusuf, if you want to add anything there while we finish up. I would I would agree with you uh, totally. Uh, I mean, like any new technology, the price start a little bit higher, but the drop is the uh, penetration uh, increase. There's more deployment, and uh, next generation of the product goes down. But uh, already we've done some studies. You can find on CBS Alliance, which shows the economic already is close to Wi-Fi today. And I wouldn't be surprised in the near future that it'll be uh, almost equal uh, economics. Okay, uh, we're at the top of the hour. Again, we'll get back to all of the questions that people ask them. And I'm, I really thank everybody for attending. And thank you, Ed and Yusuf, for thank you. going through this all. My pleasure. Thank you.